dear colleagues and guests, uh, I have an honor to present to you uh, Mrs. Elka Fatmi, who is a winner of prestigious Euromed Journalist Award and recently experienced uh, herself Arab, Arab Spain in Egypt. And uh, we would like her to, to share her experience in the recent, recent moments. And this lecture is organized jointly with the um, Anna Lind Foundation and in the auspices of Baltic Mediterranean Spring Festival. So the floor is yours, Mrs. Okay. 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 Mm -hmm. Miss. Okay. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, is audio good? Everyone can hear me properly? Great. Okay, so my name is Ithar El Katakni. I'm a journalist. I just turned 24. I'm Egyptian. I was born in Saudi Arabia. I was raised in Egypt. I've lived all my life in Egypt. I've never been to America. And um, I've just, I graduate on Sunday with two master's degrees, a master's in business administration and a master's in television and digital journalism. Um, I've won a couple of international awards for journalism. I won the CNN African Journalist of the Year Award in 2009. And I won the Anna Lind Euro Mediterranean uh, Print Journalism Award from Prince Albert III in Monte Carlo. And recently, actually just two days ago, I just heard that I'm a finalist in uh, Samir Kosser Award for Freedom of the Press in Lebanon, and the award ceremony is next Thursday. So hopefully I'll, I'll get that too. That'll be interesting. So um, today I've been here for a week. It's been a very interesting week. Latvia is a very pretty, very quiet, very uh, quaint city, uh, country. I've traveled a while. I've been to Valmira. I've been to Liepai and Daugapos, I think. Sorry, pronunciation is wrong, I know. Um, so I very much enjoyed it talking to people and it's been very interesting and hopefully I've been able to kind of share a little bit of Egypt, you know, about the region, whether it's the revolution, use of media, journalism, even women and gender in the Arab region. So today the presentation, I think we have an hour and a half, so I actually only had the presentation, it's only around 30 minutes, because I'd very much actually like to answer questions and see what more you'd like to hear about. Because, you know, the Arab Spring and social media and journalism in the region is a topic that can take weeks and weeks and weeks to discuss. So I'd rather focus on what you'd particularly like to hear about. So the topic of the presentation today is not so much what's been happening, but the reasons behind it. What it was that actually led to, you know, the sudden uprising that no one could have ever imagined. Um, I just recently working on a new journal, we just launched a new journal called the Cairo Journal, uh, the Cairo Review of Global Affairs. And we've been working on it for six months. Our, uh, we were supposed to launch on February 1st. And our cover story, you know, we had an interview with Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. We, you know, we managed to reach a lot of influential people to contribute to this. And our main feature was why the Arab world will never revolt, or at least not in this generation. So we were supposed to launch five days after revolution began in Egypt. So obviously we had to stop and not print and actually delay until just we just relaunched it on April. So it was something that no one really predicted. And today I'll be discussing why it is I actually think that this is the case. Why no one, why, why no one thought it would happen and why it actually did happen. So just a little bit of history. You know, the Arab world has always been considered on the brink. Everyone's always, you know, there's very much a huge youth population. You know, in Egypt, 60% of the population is under the age of 25. 40% of people live on less than $2 a day. That's actually below the UN poverty line. You have a huge population that's frustrated, that's economically, um, you know, unsatisfied. They can't find jobs, they can't buy apartments, they can't get married, and they're unemployed. So the, everyone always expected, you know, it's almost going to happen. But before it could happen, we need, you know, we need economic reform, we need, you know, a middle class that needs to grow because society is becoming very polarized. You have a very rich social class and the poor are getting poor. But we need a middle class, you need democratic reform, you need this new culture of democracy to grow. But how to get there, no one actually really discussed it. It was just, this is what you need for economy to grow. United States, I'm focusing a, a bit more here in my presentation on the United States because they're actually much more, when we discuss in Egypt or the region, um, they actually play a big role and I'll discuss that more. But you know, the aid from the United States in the last, you know, under you know, Bush, in the last 10 years, so from in 2009, it was more than the entire amount spent from 1991 to 2001. And this aid was, you know, there for democracy, for promoting democracy. But in reality, you know, it, it went to 
reform that supported, you know, democracy, but not democracy that would actually lead to a real change. It was gradual, you know, constant transition. And these are four reasons I believe that, you know, they are actually part of the reason, you know, whether it's the military, you want to keep the military strong, the ties with Israel, you know, the access to energy, energy resources, but most of all, the fear of an Islamist regime, that if these regions, if these countries do get democracy, this will mean that, you know, Muslims will take over and this is bad for the U.S. So... So it was always the appearance of reform. Um, a political scientist, I like this quote, he says that the Arab region was always in a process of endless transition, you know, we're working towards, if you read any, you know, the papers over the last 10 years, it's always, you know, it's defensive, we're managing, it's very piecemeal, it's very bit by bit, we're doing it slowly, slowly, slowly. But there's never any, any change of the underlying power structure, and both, you know, the US and the EU policy always supported, you know, doing it gradually over time. And this is, you know, this is reasons, you know, you supported weak parties, you um, promoted, you know, that women should be in parliament, but always in positions where they actually had never really, really any power. Trainings, you know, um, organizational, I remember, you know, at last four, three or four years, we've always had, you know, USAID sponsored, you know, this is a training course on how, you know, political parties should be set up. But nothing actually ever happened. It was all very much just rhetoric. So I thought it would be interesting, especially you know, from a country that just very, very recently with your history, to share a little bit of you, you know, how the U.S. actually supported the colored revolutions, you know, whether it was the Rose Revolution in Georgia, the Orange Revolution in Ukraine. Very much, you know, um, I remember interviewing, uh, there's a, Ayman Noor, who was the, in our first presidential elections, uh, he was the runner-up and Jen jailed for like three years. But anyway, in one of his interviews, he talked about how that there would never be, the U.S. would never support Egypt in, in revolting, and he didn't mean financially, he meant, you know, whether it was emotionally, whether it was media, whether it was support that would cause international media to focus on the country, which would mean that the rulers, the, whoever, the dictators in whatever country, wouldn't be able to take reforms or take steps that would be harmful to their public. So he said it was never going to happen. When you compare, you know, between in Serbia and, you know, as you can see the examples, Always the U.S. supported the independent media. You know, in Georgia, this was funded, you know, by the U.S. Prada Ukraine, and in, this was actually located in D.C., totally funded by the U.S. The U.S. actually supported initiatives which directly led, you know, that helped these countries to revolt. It actually helped them to overthrow, you know, in Serbia, to actually overthrow the president in 2000. And it was always, you know, in whether it's, you know, Eastern Europe, Latin America, the agenda was always very clear. It's always very direct, you can trace very much from their efforts or their initiatives to support the country's revolution. And even if you read the, definitely any of the political um, uh, speeches that were made at the time, it was very much the U.S. is telling this country that if you do not do this, we will withdraw support from you, we support the people. Contrast that to, for example, during our revolution in Egypt, Obama's speeches from the very beginning, you know, people, you should be slow and support your president. And then when the people started to win, you know, okay, no, the people have freedom. Because you're trying to balance very much um, who do we support. You know, the U.S. has huge interests in the region. And it had very much, uh, you know, it's very nice to have a regime which helps you, that actually, you know, Egypt with the second biggest recipient of U.S. aid after Israel. And, you know, which actually means that our military is funded by the U.S., so actually we can't ever do anything without U.S. permission. But Egypt is very much, we call it in Arabic, Umm dunya mother of the world, you know, which is a little arrogant, but at the same time, you know, with the history and how much influence we have over the region. What Egypt does, you know, everyone follows, not just because of our population, but because, you know, of our strength and our historical and political perspective. So definitely, the West's rhetoric was always clear, but not so much in our region, because they have something to lose, if I can put it that way. Okay, so for the Arab opposition, um, you know, in, in Egypt, I, and that's what I'm most qualified to speak on, since in Egypt, we've had, you know, whether it's the Kifaya, enough organization, we've had the April 6th youth movement, you've had the Muslim Brotherhood, who have been, you know, ostracized, and there's been a huge crackdown on them for the last, you know, four or five years. They've always been, you know, the argument is that we're arguing on two fronts. We're actually dealing with our own dictatorship and rulers, and we're also dealing with a foreign policy which is not lenient towards us, which is not, not just not supportive, but actually somehow works against us. That if we actually take steps towards, you know, democratic reform, they will then, you know, for example, decrease the aid that the country receives, which means our rulers will crack down on us more. And again, of course, the U.S. bias towards Israel. But definitely, 
what I believe the principal reason is again is that the international community does not support, did not support, or does not want to support any kind of rulership where a Muslim take over, take over, uh, Islamic representation would be in existence. So this kind of fuels anger. You know, like I was saying, there's a lot of frustration in the Arab world, a lot of you know unhappiness. People are you know still running after how do I feed my children, how do I work, and we're not getting a chance to speak out. We're not getting a chance to actually be free. So. What happened? So this has been the case for you know a very long period of time. It isn't new since I was a student a long time ago, freshman, maybe seven years ago. Um, you know, Iraq. We had protests. Everything. It was never not known. People always knew that you know anything that had a kind of Islamist base, the U.S. doesn't want. The U.S. will not support. And without the U.S. support, we can't do anything because of again the culture of fear. Egypt's been under emergency law for you know 30, 40 years. Um, it keeps being renewed, and again, Mubarak's always used the fear, you know, of we need this emergency law because I need to crack down the Muslim Brotherhood because if we don't crack down, they will take over.